We're in chapter 3 of Matthew, if you want to turn over there. You know, we've spent the first two chapters kind of going through. It just kind of fell into place where it happened right at Christmas time. And so we spent the first few chapters kind of in that Christmas theme. And we get all excited about Advent and we read stories about babies and shepherds and wise men and all this stuff. But the cool thing about God and his word and his story is that he didn't stop with all of the prophecies or fulfilling them just to bring his son into the world. And um, he's actually, we're actually going to read about someone else that was prophesied about ahead of time. And he was the forerunner for King Jesus. And his name's John the Baptist. And so that's what we're going to be covering tonight. Sometimes we can, we can read through some of these historical accounts and uh, if we don't really ask the right questions we can just read it and go well that's good information I, I now realize what happened in that chapter John did this and Jesus did that and everything's good but as we continue to look at this idea of heaven coming to, to earth as Jesus incarnate God in the flesh dwelling among us what does that mean? What did that mean for the people in his day and age? What does that mean for us? And it's interesting as we look at and we get into this chapter tonight, a lot has happened since chapter 2. About 30-something years has happened. Um, other, other gospels cover, cover some of Jesus' childhood, but in chapter 3 of Matthew... He really jumps right into when Jesus is about to be launched into his public ministry. And so as we get into this, we're going to be met with a, a character, and he's quite a character. He kind of stands out above, uh, amongst other people, and there's a reason why. But let's start reading here in verse number one, and let's just see what the Lord has for us as we move along. It starts out with this phrase, in those days. It's not real specific. Like I said, we're covering about 31, maybe 29 to 31 years, somewhere in there, from chapter 2 to chapter 3. And in those days, basically says an historical event happened, is what, along the lines of what it means. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And this was his message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So this is John the Baptist, and he was prophesying. This is another uh, Old Testament prophecy that was, is coming to uh, fruition in the New Testament. It's about 550 years has passed since Isaiah approximately, from when Isaiah wrote this down, to when John the Baptist is fulfilling it. And this whole idea of prepare the way of the Lord, uh, I want to read the, the passage in Isaiah just real quick because I think it gives a little even more clarity than Matthew 3. It says, A voice cries in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So what is being painted here in this picture of making the path straight it's like, how many of you know that there's a lot of road construction in Montana in the summertime, right? I was told when we moved here, there's two seasons. There's winter and there's construction season. And I did not know what that meant until I moved here and I got a taste of it. Can you think back to when they originally came through these mountains and they cut these roads? Can you imagine that? Have you ever been to Alberton? I can't remember the name of the trail. Mullen Trail. It is a, a really neat and historic walk. It's actually some of the original trails of the original roads that were cut. I don't remember if he was a lieutenant or a captain or whatever it was, Mullen, but he cut them. And the idea, the, paint, the picture that's being painted here with this statement is go in and make, it, make the path flat, make it travelable. In other words, clear everything out of the way to where when Jesus comes on the scene, nobody will miss it. Make the path wide and flat and straight to where everybody understands it. And that's who was prophesied about here. John the Baptist, to, and this is his job. His message is repent. Why? 
for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. There's gospels that say the kingdom of God. And you say, well, why does this one say the kingdom of heaven when others say the kingdom of God? And you've got to remember that Matthew is writing primarily to the Jews. And there, was, there were times that Jews didn't even think about saying the Hebrew words for God, Yahweh or Jehovah. It was considered blasphemy. And so he knows he's writing, so he's wanting to write in a way that doesn't derail the people that he's trying to reach. And he knows that they believe and know that God exists in heaven, and so he says the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But this message of repent is one that's going to ring true throughout this whole chapter. That John is the first prophet speaking the actual literal words of God for 400 years. 400 years there's been silence from the Lord. Not that he's not been active, not that he hadn't been making sure things happened that needed to happen, but as far as a prophetic word from the Lord, it's been 400 years. Remember, John was this, this is the John that was born to Zacharias and Elizabeth. Uh, in the Christmas story, we see that uh, come about. And if we look at the timetables, this means that John was probably uh, some sort of cousin to Jesus. And he's about six months older than Jesus. So that just gives you some context here. But his job is to prepare the way of the Lord and to make his paths straight. This passage in Matthew quotes this in, in, with the idea in mind that it's not a literal gravel, pavement, dirt road. It is a road that is being paved to where when our hearts hear and see and comprehend who Jesus Christ is, our hearts have been prepared. So it's a road that's laid in our hearts. And the message is to repent. So what does it mean to repent? You've probably heard me talk about this before. But the, the, the idea of repentance is not a feeling. It's not a feeling of sorrow. It's not a feeling of guilt. We, we come face to face with our sins. We realize that we've, we're sinners. And so we realize that that's, that's a conviction from the Holy Spirit. But to repent is actually a word of action. It's a change of mind that moves one to change in behavior and action. Look at it this way. If I was in New York City, and, and you knew that uh, you said, Peter, to get from Kansas to, from New York City to Los Angeles, you're going to need to turn left here and get on this highway. It, the directions to get there are kind of irrelevant. I'm either in New York City or I'm in Los Angeles. I know there's a lot of ground in between. But you have to turn around and leave New York, do you not, to be in L.A. You have to leave being a sinner, destined for hell, by the way, and choose to accept salvation through Jesus Christ and turn from your sin and saying, that is behind me, I don't want it anymore. It brings nothing but death, and I'm going I'm going to be a believer in Jesus Christ. I'm going to be saved. I'm going from New York and I'm leaving New York and I'm going to L.A. You're leaving a destination. It's not just a thought in your mind. It's not just a feeling that you have. Or it's not a feeling that you have. It's not something that happens to be able to come to Christ. It's what, it, what coming to Christ is. A heart is repentant. When I came to faith in Jesus Christ in 2002, it was not... It was not an intellectual understanding of, of the situation. It was me looking at my sin and how much destruction it had caused to my family and realized that I needed to turn my life around, literally. I needed to turn to Jesus and become his. The kingdom of heaven in his hand is this idea that, I mean, John is literally out in the wilderness. He's preaching this. People are coming to him to be baptized, and somebody's on his way. And Jesus is so close, and that's what he's saying. He is, he's almost here. He's here, he's, he's coming into this world, he's coming to this world, he's coming into our presence, and we need to be ready for him. John's main message wasn't, you're a sinner, you need to repent. John's main message was, the Messiah King is coming 
The call to repentance is, was the response to the news that the king and his kingdom were coming. Indeed, we're already here. In verse 4, we go on. It says, Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Now, a lot of you kids that probably say, you've probably eaten stuff like that, haven't you? Never eaten locusts? Not about wild honey. Have you ever found wild honey in the wild? It's pretty good. I've never eaten a locust before. My uncle ate a locust, but it was on a dare. <laughs> this picture here is of, it's really, if you look back, I think it's 2 Kings 1 is where we see this same attire, and that's with Elijah. Okay? So when this is said about John the Baptist, uh, we're going to see this tied into Elijah here. It says, when Jerusalem and then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when they saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, or he saw them, coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. In that day and age, it was... It was the religious elite, and I, I, I would imagine if you looked at our society today, you might see some parallels. Because you had the Pharisees and you had the Sadducees. The Pharisees were your legalistic crowd. They were the ones that took the law and added law to it. And raked you over the coals and ridiculed you and demeaned you if you didn't keep the law to the T. I mean, they added so much to it, it was ridiculous. And they were legalistic about it. Legalism today is, is something that I believe kills the church. There's no grace in, in legalism. On the other side of the things, you've got the Sadducees who had pretty much just adopted the, the ways of the world. They, they kind of picked and chose out of Scripture what they believed. They did not believe in the resurrection. And so you can, you can kind of see in our world, you've got... The religious types that go to the whole extreme and they've taken upon themselves to be everybody's judge all the way over to the liberal side of our church in America today who wants to be right in line with the rest of the world and approve of everything that the world is doing and jumping on all the bandwagons and accepting them and all kinds of stuff. And taking this part of scripture and leaving that. that you, you can't do that. Because if that's what you're doing, you're not really believing and implementing and applying all of God's word. You're not being obedient in all of God's commands. And so somewhere in the middle is Jesus Christ and he comes on the scene full of truth and grace. Most of us tend to lean at least a little one, one way or the other. But Jesus, being God and man, he's right in the middle, full of truth and grace. So John the Baptist, he comes on the scene. He's dressed in animal skins. He's got a leather, almost like a, maybe a lifting belt, you know? That's what I picture anyway, around his waist. And he's eating weird food, and he's out in the wilderness. And for some reason, people from all of Jerusalem and Judea, they're, they're coming to get baptized. And you think about it, it in for just a second, if, you've got, if you live in a world where you've got the main two religious sects, one being legalistic and the other one being in bed with the world, is that going to sit very well with you? I mean, if, if you're in the middle somewhere, you're going, that's not right, but that's not right either. And so this guy comes on the scene, and all he's saying is, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The, the king is coming. Repent. That's refreshing. That's not, I need to live by this set of rules or I'm going to hell. And it's not, oh, God loves everybody and he'll just accept everybody and that's not truth either. He comes in the middle and says, listen, God is at hand. He's here in the flesh and you need to change the direction that you're headed and turn to him. This idea of Elijah, an Elijah-like forerunner is predicted in Micah 4, 5. But it's not as if John had known about 
uh, Elijah and, and heard about how he dressed and thought, man, I'm going to dress up like that guy. And I'm just going to, maybe I'm just going to try and, maybe I'll, maybe I'll be this guy. He's actually going by the words of his father that were spoken to his father, actually, in Luke 1, 17. And it says, and he will go before him in the spirit of, and power of Elijah. It's talking about, this is prophetic from the angel of the Lord to Zacharias. He says, and, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just... I'm sorry, I skipped something. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Now, that verse right there probably describes John's job description better than the highway thing I mentioned earlier. He is there. He's coming to prepare a people to receive the Savior of the universe. This is simply who John the Baptist was. And one might say he was that way before he was even created in his mother's womb. So who was Jesus calling? He was calling all Israel. Started with the Jews in Jerusalem. Those are the ones that were close by and those that are around um, the Jordan. But he was calling them to repentance. He was also aggressively confronting the religious elite of the day. And this was literally a, a movement amongst the people because of that unrest. You think about it. You are the chosen people of God. You've been living in silence from the Lord for 400 years, and all of a sudden a prophet pops up. I want to know what he's saying because if it's a prophet of the Lord, it's important, and we need to go listen to him. And so they're coming. In our day and age, uh, John might have tried to... Uh, Send out marketing flyers, consult marketing experts, you know, to get more people in the doors. He might have done some Facebook ads or some Google ads or whatever. John relied on the power of God to do his marketing for him. Remember, God had literally been silent for 400 years, but he was still active. Don't miss that. It's just that the Jewish people hadn't had a word. And they were anxious to hear. It's interesting that uh, Josephus, if you're familiar with Josephus, he was a, a historian, a Jewish historian that lived in the time of Jesus. He actually wrote more about John the Baptist than he did about Jesus. And so this was obviously a big deal back then. So what did John the Baptist's baptism mean? Because a lot of people will get to this story and they'll see Jesus get baptized by John the Baptist and they get all kinds of confused about why. But it signified a person's willingness to turn from his or her sins and from the false belief that being born a Jew automatically put a person in right relationship with God. That's essentially what John's baptism meant. They had to turn from their evil ways and even their false hope that they had. And we'll get to that here in a minute uh, in, in Matthew 3. But the Jews were already familiar with baptism. It's actually one of the, the uh, rituals that took place if in, a Gentile wanted to become a Jew. Um, so you, could, you would get baptized. There was also a sacrifice. There was circumcision. And then they also memorized portions of Moses' law. So that's, they were already familiar with this idea of baptism. So this wasn't anything necessarily really new. But they were to be baptized, and they were coming and confessing their sins. And this is what, what we see in this chapter is really elements of how we come to Jesus, right? We're convicted with our sins. We are challenged to repent. Hopefully, we're challenged to repent. And we're going to confess our sins. And if you remember from our study through the Beatitudes, um, Confessing our sin basically means that I agree with God on what he says I've done. Right? If God says it's sin and I go, Lord, forgive me for whatever it is, whatever your sin is, God goes, okay, good, we agree on that. <laughs> it's essentially what it says. When you get conviction from the Holy Spirit that you're doing something you shouldn't be doing and you want to confess that, that's good because that means that you agree with God. And now we can start working together. Now we're moving in the same direction. So baptism and confession follows a mental decision to repent, to turn away from our sin, 
and agree with God about our sinful nature and identify with Christ. That's the last part is the baptism is to identify with Christ. Here in this account, John is calling the Jews to repent and be baptized as a way to make the hearts ready to receive our Savior and King, Jesus Christ and his kingdom. So the, that's John's baptism. Christian baptism is like John's in the sense um, that it demonstrates repentance, but it is also more. It is being baptized into Christ, that is, into his death and his resurrection. This idea of brood of vipers, uh, this, is, this is a group, like I said earlier, these are the legalistic uh, precisions, is one theologian's term for them. They're very precise. They follow the law. They follow the rules. They even make up their own. And the Sadducees are liberalized Jews. <clears throat> Looks like I got ahead in my notes. Let's start reading in verse 9 here. It says, And do not presume, and this is John speaking to the crowds. He's also talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He says, Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear fruit, good fruit, is cut down and thrown into the fire. The next paragraph is going to also end with the word fire in it. What John's doing here is he's coming in and saying, this is a picture of what's going to happen in this world. And this is a truth that as believers we cannot shy away from. Because we are called to present the gospel. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is that we are sinners. He is the Son of God. He came down to this earth, dwelt on this earth, died for our sins, was buried, was raised again the third day, and now sits at the right hand of the Father. And our salvation is through His blood alone. For by grace you have been saved through faith. All right? So that is the gospel. And when we present that gospel, if we don't also talk about the fact that Jesus Christ died for sinners and that there is a consequence for not believing in him, we are not sharing the full gospel. And can I just say, any church that preaches that everybody goes to heaven is sending droves of people to hell. Because if you come into this church and all I talk about is God's love, which is true... And all I talk about is heaven, which is, which is available. But never tell you that it comes down to you turning from your old ways, asking God to forgive your sins and accepting him as your Lord and Savior and being born again spiritually, then I have set you up to go to hell. So, <clears throat> I can't read over something like this and just brush over it. And that's why John is in these guys' faces going, guys, the rotten trees that aren't bearing any fruit, in other words, the people that are not followers of Christ, they're going to end up burning in fire one day. As unpopular a message as that is in this day and age, it really doesn't matter because God said it and he calls the shots. He is God, I am not. And I'm going to trust him because I've seen him reveal his truth and his love and grace and joy and salvation time and time and time again. And it's there if people will just accept it. But we can't shy away from that message that the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Verse 11, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand. If you, in that day and age, they were agriculturalists, they grew wheat, and they would harvest the wheat. And they would do whatever they did the wheat to get the pods to break apart, and they would pitch it up in the air and the, on a windy day and the wind would blow the chaff away and blow the straw away and the wheat kernels would fall to the ground and that's how you get the wheat. So his winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear the threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. 
John's saying, guys, there's two ways that this goes. You're either going to believe in the man that's about to walk up here. He didn't say that. You're, you're, back to, you're going to have to believe in the king that is coming, in his kingdom that's coming, and is here, or you're going to reject it, and this is what's in store for you. It's a sobering message, but if it is not stated, I have done you, I, I've failed my job at this pulpit. Verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan and John, or to John, to be baptized by him. And John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? This is a significant statement. This is John obviously seeing his place and his position rightly with who Jesus was, but he did have a job to do. This is the significance of emergence of Jesus after many years of of obscurity. These first works of his public ministry carry great meaning in understanding the rest of his ministry. John recognized the, the irony of the situation because Jesus had nothing to repent of. And it would be more appropriate for Jesus to probably baptize him. Verse 15, But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. Jesus understood why this seemed strange to John, but nevertheless, it was necessary to fulfill all righteousness. Guys, we have Jesus Christ as our example in so many ways, but one of the utmost ways that we have him as an example is his obedience to the Father. When God the Father gave him a command, a job to do, he did it even to his own death. This is just the beginning of his ministry. But Jesus didn't have anything to repent for, so why was he being baptized? Because he came to this earth and put on flesh to not just identify with us, but to become one of us, but a perfect version of us because he was fully God and fully man. And so he's coming in and he's going, I can't expect you to follow my example unless I set it first. God said to do this and I'm going to do it. So John, let's do this. Let's fulfill all righteousness. The theologian Bruce says, in accordance with the symbolic significance of the rite as denoting death to an old life and rising to a new, Jesus came to be baptized in the sense of dying to the old nature, natural relations uh, to parents, neighbors, earthly calling, and devoting himself henceforth to his public messianic vocation. Let's keep reading in verse 16. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. You see, Jesus' act of obedience and a righteous identification with sinners motivated by love was how Jesus was seen as my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Take this in for just a second. All the crowds from Jerusalem, all the crowds from Judea, and everybody right around the Jordan has come to be baptized by John the Baptist, this crazy guy that's wearing animal skins and eating honey and locusts, to hear, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And here walks Jesus, this guy that John says, I have no business baptizing him. I don't even have any business taking off his sandals, which is the lowest of the low of a servant's job. He said, I'm not even worthy to take his sandals off. And he comes and he baptizes him and he brings him out of the water and the Holy Spirit comes down on him in physical form and a voice from heaven says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. I mean, talk about a mic drop, right? I mean, you're there, you're waiting, you're just, I'm just waiting my turn so I can repent and get baptized. And all of a sudden, God speaks from heaven. 
<laughs> I mean, we can read this a hundred times and go, oh, that's cool. That would have been cool to see. Can you imagine what these people went home and told everybody about? I was there the day that Jesus got baptized and God spoke from heaven. He's been silent for 400 years. He's talking through this prophet. Then he spoke audibly himself. I mean, that's craziness. All three members of the Trinity, all present at one time for all to see and hear. When his voice, when this voice of God the Father spoke from heaven, everyone knew that Jesus was not just another man being baptized. They knew Jesus was the perfect Son of God, the promised Messiah, identifying with sinful man. By this, everyone knew that Jesus was different. Jesus was baptized so to be identified with sinful man, but he was also baptized to be identified to sinful man. So this is great, Peter. What do I do with this? As, as I read through this and I pondered this, like there's a whole bunch of truths of what happened here. So that's great. That's John the Baptist. He was prophesied about. It. He was a prophet of God. Do you realize that we have all been uh, handpicked? If you were a follower of Christ, you've been handpicked as a witness for Jesus Christ. You say, well, he had a calling from 550 years beforehand. He didn't have a chance. God said it was going to happen, so it's going to happen. I'm pretty sure it's the same thing. In a lot of ways. Look what Ephesians 1, 5 through 10 says. In love, and I stole two words from verse 4. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. According to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glory, glorious grace. With which he has blessed us. In the beloved, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he has set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. As we read the Bible about this man that was picked to make the path straight, that is what we are called to do in individual people's lives as we come across them. Maybe our message isn't right in their face, repent. But maybe it's, do you know that God loves you? Do you know Jesus? Who is Jesus to you? Asking them questions to help them process the truth of who he is. It's the job that we've been given to do. At the end of this book, it'll say, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. This is the command that God gave his followers. And as we get into this book and we realize what it means for heaven to come to earth, Jesus is revealed in this. As he's been revealed to each and every one of us, We've gotten to choose what we're going to do with that. Many of us have made a decision to follow him faithfully. To, to ask him to be our savior. And to save us. Some of us haven't done that yet. Can I just say, repent and be saved. Turn from whatever it is you're chasing, if it's not Jesus... And chase after him. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. How does God's word apply to each and every one of us on a daily basis? That's the example we can take from John the Baptist and these religious elite. And if we find ourselves in either one of those camps, <clears throat> I pray that God helps you to get your heart right. And if I ever slip into that, you confront me about it. Okay? But as we read through 
and look at this. We are called, just like John was called, not to necessarily be a prophet all those years ago, but to be a messenger of hope today, to be a witness for Jesus Christ to people that don't know him. We have been called to lay out the truth of the gospel for people. And we've been, lay, we've been uh, burdened with the task of making Jesus Christ known.